as men have become more feminine over the last few decades, this has coincided with that 24 hour news cycle with the complete syndication of politics and media everywhere you go. So now you see all of these men, not coincidentally, in support of these emotionally driven narratives. Yep. And these are things that their grandfathers would have belted them for. Like, <laughs> you really believe that, you idiot? Welcome to the Father State. I am Jesse Lee Peterson. Thank you so much for being with me. I absolutely appreciate it. The Father State is on subscribe star. So click the link in the video description to support our work. And uh, again, thank you in advance, folks. We got a lot to do. We've done a lot. Got a lot to do. It's amazing. I have with me John Doyle. And John is the host of the YouTube show, Heck Off Kami. Heck Off Kami. John, welcome to the Fallen State. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It is amazing to be here, as they say, and looking forward to discussing things with you. It's absolutely amazing. I, I, I went back and looked at the show, some of the show where I had you on my radio show back in uh, 2019. Mm-hmm. And you have changed a lot. You don't look the same. You don't sound the same. A lot has changed since then. A lot has changed since then in the country and in my life. I grew a beard. I, I moved out of my house. Yeah. I live in Texas now. So everything is uh, everything is moving along. So when I talked to you on the radio show back then, you were in college or had just dropped out or going to drop out? I had dropped out, uh, which I received congratulations from you for doing, actually. Yeah. yeah. And are you glad you did? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and why? Well, I just don't think I needed it, which isn't to say that, you know, people shouldn't go to college. If you feel like you want to become a doctor or a lawyer, I think that it's necessary. But there exists a path where people think like, oh, this is just the next step after high school. And so they'll say to themselves, well, I enjoyed taking biology in high school, so I'm going to go get a degree in biomedical science. And now they have this like four year degree, which even they know, if they're honest, is more or less an excuse to delay maturation and growing up. And they just want to party and still live on their parents' expenses uh, in most cases. Cases. So it's, I think, has become a way to not so much cultivate uh, excellence in students and more so to just like delay maturation and responsibility and just party and then, you know, walk away with a piece of paper and tell yourself that it was worth it. And so what does your parent, uh, your, your, what does your parent think of you now? What do they think of you that you dropped out and time had gone by? Now they support it and they'll tell the story that they supported it the day I told them, but that is not the case. They were very upset with me. Yeah. Uh, and I just thought, well, okay, I guess we'll see how this goes. And then things ended up working out well. And so now they'll tell the story differently that they always supported me and that they were, but that's not, that's not what happened. What, uh, and so, uh, I looked at that interview. You look like a little kid, man. Now you look like a grown adult. A white well, man. That's that's a horror. I would like to. I'd like to look like a grown white man. That's why the beard is important because I can actually grow uh, a pretty good beard, and I think that it helps me be taken more seriously by older audiences. Yeah. Because if I'm saying things that are against the established paradigm of you know approved talking points, and I look like a kid, it's easier for people to say, "Well, what does he know? He's a kid." And so this, I think, is better for people to take me a bit more seriously. And so, are you are you friends with Nick Fontaine or are all those guys now? Yeah, yeah, we get along. You know, I'm a businessman. My my job is to get along with people. I have yeah. no enemies in this business except for communists and pedophiles. But, you know, if, if you're not having them as enemies, you're probably not doing too well. Yeah, Nick is doing very well with with uh, his organization. And uh, I spoke there recently, and it was very, very impressive with what he's doing. So you got married. What made you get married? Married? Yeah. I didn't get married. Oh, you didn't get married? I thought no, I already no, no. got married. No, you didn't get married. Nice. I did not get married. Oh, okay. Why, why haven't you gotten married? Well, I, I just haven't found a woman who's up to my standards yet. Oh. Uh, I think that's, uh, and that's probably not going to be too easy to do. But, you know, if and when that, that comes along, I will, uh, I will jump on the opportunity. And so what is your standard? What are you looking for? <laughs> well, 
<laughs> you know, I would prefer a woman who hasn't produced some form of pornography of herself. I would like a woman who, above all other things, wants to be a mother and a homemaker, not a, uh, a lawyer or a CEO or some form of girl boss. I want a woman who wants to fulfill her natural purpose as a woman. I don't want a woman who's trying to toil in the fields like the men are supposed to be doing. I want her to, you know, above all other things, wants to be a mother, wants to be a wife. And the problem is, as I'm sure you're aware, women aren't raised to know how to do things like that. Anymore. Yeah. They don't understand what it means to be a wife or to be a mother. They think that means like just on a piece of paper being married to so-and-so. They don't understand the responsibilities that come with that. So it's going to be pretty hard to find a woman like that. But uh, I'm hoping, So you hoping probably never get married then. Well, I don't know about that because <laughs> I, I do want to have kids. And so the prerequisite to that would have to be marriage. So Yeah. So the heck off commie. Tell mm -hmm. the folks what, what that is about, all about. That's just, that's me telling communists to go away. You know, the, the whole aesthetic of the show is this very uh, 1950s retro aesthetic, which I think calls back to the Red Scare and everything that was going on then, which I think we can see has been totally vindicated. I mean, the country is run by communists and the entire agenda of the world is moving towards global communism. So the name of the show basically seeks to shine a light on that uh, and let people know that, you know, that's what it's about. Though what tends to happen is people think because it is that sort of retro aesthetic and because it is talking about commies, they think it's a much more surface level brand of, of right wing content or conservative content that we make. But people who watch my show or who, or who are relatively familiar with my work will know that we do get pretty in depth with things in a way that a lot of people don't or aren't willing to do. Um, you are a Christian. True. And what does it mean to be a Christian? Uh, simply, I would say just to have faith in God. But I, th I think the faith is what people don't understand. People think faith means believing, but it doesn't. It's a different thing. And I always talk about the bridge as the, the analogy. So it's one thing to believe that a bridge exists, but to have faith in the bridge would be to walk across it and trust it to actually support you. And, and that's how I, I view Christianity. Yeah. Like if you're not actually willing to follow the Bible, belief in Jesus in the abstract isn't going to be enough to save you uh, in the afterlife or on earth at all. You are, Christianity is being wiped out in America. It's like yes. fewer and fewer people are now admitting or saying that they are Christian. Why do you think there is an attack upon Christianity and no other religion? Well, because it's true. Uh, and that's the only thing that would actually serve as an impediment to what they're trying to do, which is fundamentally a satanic agenda, which, of course, is prophesized in the Bible. But, yeah, there's a reason why you were allowed to go and attack, you know, Islamic people, for example, in 2015. It was a very almost edgy talking points. And, you know, Republicans were allowed to feel like they were really fighting back if they said things like radical Islamic terrorism. Right. But you could never you could say that. Um, or if you're going to attack Christianity, that's fine. But you could never say anything positive about Christianity the way that you can also say positive things about Islam, or even the way that they'll talk about it, you know, radical Islamic terrorism, they would have to put the word radical in front of it, they would have to add terrorism, they couldn't just criticize Islam as fundamentally incompatible with Western civilization, which is rooted in Christianity, they had to only talk about the, the you know, terrorism that we were all seeing, but they could never get on television and say anything positive about Christianity. And if they do, it's this very, very, vague sort of televangelist understanding where Christianity just means that you have to be nice to people and be tolerant. They don't talk about the aspect of it that involves, you know, militancy or, or discipline or anything like that that would actually advocate more so for intolerance. The one thing I'd noticed about the attack on Christianity, when I was growing up, Christianity was the thing. It was America. It was no separate from the person and Christianity, no matter what color. Now they have narrowed it down to me white supremacy, whatever that's supposed to mean. And they're doing all they can to wipe out white Christian straight males because they know that if they can wipe them out, it's over for Christianity. There would be nothing left but destruction in America. Am I seeing it wrong? Do you disagree or agree with that? I, I agree completely. And a lot of times people struggle to talk about how anti-white the overriding agenda is, but that's really what it is, plain and simple. And the motive for that is also pretty simple, which is just that if you wanted to completely restructure a society, you naturally would want to turn people against the people who have the deepest roots 
in preserving that society, which just so happened to be white Christian men. The same way if you wanted to overthrow China, you would try to turn people against the Han Chinese. Or if you wanted to overthrow Russia, uh, well, you might support a proxy war in Ukraine, or you might try to turn people against the native Russian population. So it's the same thing in America. It's just the people who have the deepest roots and therefore the greatest incentive in preserving the traditional American society are white Christian men who up until 10 years ago were all straight. <laughs> and so... You're out and about doing your thing and uh, with uh, uh, heck, heck off commie. Yes. And it's clear that Christian white men, men are under attack. Are you concerned about your life or, or are you concerned when you're out doing your protests and questioning people? Do you have to watch your back more now? How do you deal with all that? Yeah. I'm not too worried about it, to be honest. I actually would be honored if uh, I were, you know, targeted or something. I mean, God forbid, my, my parents would be devastated, but I think that that would just be a sign of being effective above all else. And, you know, if that's the case, then I feel as though I've done everything that I could. Uh, I still have plans for the future, but I'm, I'm confident that I'm more or less operating on all, uh, or firing on all cylinders right now. So I guess it's, it is something I have to think about, but if it happens, it happens. I do take precautions, but I don't fear it in the way that I think a lot of people are taught to fear death because again, the lack of Christianity, they don't believe that there's anything that's going to happen them in the, uh, to them in the afterlife. They view existence not as something that was gifted to them by God, but as this thing that just was coincidental. And therefore, or because they have this finite, meaningless life, they may as well pursue as many avenues of pleasure as possible. So I always call this the checklist. They will say, well, I want to go and see Yosemite, and I want to do drugs, and I want to go skydiving, all these very inconsequential things that they view life as, you know, the bucket list, things I want to do before I die. And if I can say that I've, you know, climbed Mount Everest, then I've lived a meaningful life. They have no concept of charity, no concept of piety, of anything like that. It's always like, well, what can I do to just have this insignificant or significant amount of fun to please myself. It's a very dark way of viewing the world, I think. What is your, what is important to you? Um, creating a society or doing my best to cultivate the creation of one that allows for American families to work as little as possible and create the best life for their children, which they would create in male, female, AKA actual marriages. Why do you think we don't have more white men standing up, older or young? How old are you now? 22. Because when we first taught, you were a baby. I was. I was 19 <laughs> at the time, I believe. Yeah. Why do you think older white men and, your, uh, and, and, and of course, white men your age are not standing up in their own country? This country was founded by white men, white Christian men. The law of the land came about as a result of the Bible. And why do you think white men are not standing up? Young and old, we don't see a, a lot of them standing up and speaking out. I think it's because they don't view themselves as white men or even American men. They view themselves as like guys who just so happen to reside on this arbitrary geographic place that we call America. So yeah, they're really the first generation to be divorced from their ancestors, even their parents. I mean, they have no concept of the values upon which this country was founded and propagated. And so, you know, the best way for them to succeed and to pursue all of the things that they're taught to proceed, which is more or less just money, things of this earth, earth pleasures is to like cooperate with the system and not speak out against it. Because if you speak out against the system, you're not going to be rewarded. You're going to be persecuted. So they can live a quiet life. You know, maybe they disagree, but they'll just keep their head down in HR meetings where they're being taught that diversity is our greatest strength and that white men are to blame for all of the faults in the world. They'll keep their head down. They'll get their paycheck and then they'll go home. They'll play video games. Maybe they'll work on their motorcycle or something, but they're not pursuing anything that's really greater than themselves. I mean, the average guy in his mid twenties who I speak to doesn't go to church. He doesn't talk to women. He doesn't have a girlfriend. He's probably, you know, on dating apps like Tinder trying to cope with that, but <laughs> he really isn't pursuing anything that men of his father's or grandfather's generation would have regarded to be stepping stones in life. They've more or less just given up on these things and said that, well, as long as I have video games and marijuana, I'm okay. And so how did you come to be so solid? 
That's that's a really good question. My dad teases me about this from time to time. He he says that uh, what does he say? He's like, there's really no reason that you aren't like strung out on drugs playing video games, you know, all day. Like a lot of unfortunately, my friends from high school have ended up being. But um, I don't know. I like to think that that uh, I I'm on a mission from God. I really do believe that I'm doing God's work. Um, so I would say that that's probably the most likely explanation because everything else, you know, where I grew up would suggest that this wasn't going to be the result. But here we are. The uh, country, in spite of the fighting that you and others are doing to stop it, is becoming a communist country anyway, it seems. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's possible to turn that around at this point? I think it's possible. I don't know if it's probable. At some point, there's going to be some big event. I don't know if that's going to be a collapse, but there will be an inflection point where the incumbent regime isn't going to be able to maintain power because no coalition of people who are so divorced from reality and who are so degenerate could ever maintain power or remain in alignment with what it takes to maintain power over a country this big, a population this diverse, this divided. So eventually there's going to be, I think, an opportunity for authentic American patriots to do something I don't know if it's going to be within my lifetime. Perhaps we'll balkanize, but I don't think that we're ever going to be completely without hope. I think that to be in a state of despair is almost as bad as being in a state of being with the enemy because there's always something you can do. And history, you know, has a lot of examples of people who against all odds and almost by coincidence, these opportunities just open for them and they capitalized them on them and were able to achieve victory. So I think that we're actually in a pretty good position. The last time we talked, you mentioned your father, and the last time we talked, I think your father wasn't living in a home at the time, if I remember correctly. Yeah, my parents got divorced when I was uh, eight years old. Right. And so I was living with my mom at the time. And so are you close to your father now? Yeah. And uh, how did, did you have to make up with him? How did that, how did you happen to become close to him? No, we were always close. It was actually in a lot of, because everybody's getting divorced nowadays. Yeah. And so a lot of my friends would have families or parents who were divorced and they would always comment to me on how interesting the relationship was between my parents because they were still both attending all of the school events, the school trips. They would travel together and just stay in separate rooms. Uh, they would go to the, you know, the PTA meetings. And so they were both still equally as involved. It just nice. so happened that they didn't live in the same house together anymore. And so there was never really any, uh, any, I guess, disconnect there. But I think that my dad always kind of felt like there was. And so a couple of years ago on Father's Day, I, you know, I wrote him a card and I just basically said, hey, you know, I know I talk a lot about family structure on my channel. Just want you to know that I don't have any, you know, ill will or grudge against you or anything. And you did a great job, obviously, judging by how I turned out. So, you know, don't feel like there's any hard feelings or anything. And, you know, he thanked me. And so, yeah, we're, we're all good. Nice. So are you an only child? No, no, I have a, I have a sister. Uh, what does she think of you? She, um, <laughs> she, you know, at first, I don't know. She fluctuates. It depends because women aren't really capable of forming authentic political opinions. <laughs> and so it, it depends literally on, and what I mean by that, because people aren't really going to know what that means, I guess, out of context. I think that women will always be standing behind the man that leads them or whatever yeah. they perceive to be the power. Yeah. So women now, for example, who are outspokenly left wing are only doing so because they have weak fathers and they see the societal influence. Yeah, so sure. women who have strong fathers, they will parrot their opinions on things because that's where they view the power to be. But all these women who are you know, overwhelmingly in support of leftist agendas, you notice they all have weak fathers. And so they're just looking to whoever's going to be their force to support them and whatever they're saying. No woman in a room of of 100 people who are pro-Trump is ever going to stand up and say that they're pro-Bernie. Well, actually, they would do that because they know that the media will then make them you know, right. on MSNBC. But so my sister, she'll, you know, jump around with whatever she's seeing on the news. But, you know, it's always a phone call away. You know, don't do that. Don't get vaccinated. You Don't be <laughs> stupid. So she, she's a good kid. Uh, amazing. So you are a, uh, are you considered a Zoomer? I or, am. I am a Zoomer. A Zoomer. What's the difference between the Zoomers now and Generation Z? I think they're the same. I mean, not uh, Z, but millennials. Alpha? Oh, millennials. Yes. So my sister, she would be a millennial. She's, I think, uh, 26 now. 
And I think it's just a difference in how much of a role technology played in your life. I think that millennials, and I'm considered to be more of an older Zoomer, I guess. I was born in 1999. I feel like I was on the tail end of a, a class of children who were able to choose to enjoy technology, like come home from school and say, I think it'd be fun to play a video game, or I think it'd be fun to do this or to play something on my computer. Nowadays, kids aren't choosing to do that. They're addicted literally to their screens and to technology, and they have no concept of like playing in some sort of, you know, imaginative way without that. And so it's, it's less of like, you know, I'm going to recreationally use this drug because I enjoy it. And it's much more of a dependence now, I think for the younger generations. And it's really sad because there has to be an economy of kids outside doing things that are fun. It's not enough to say, well, I'm going to raise my kids to not be addicted to their screens. They're still not going to have as good of a childhood as frankly I did because I was able to go outside and I could ride around my neighborhood on my bike. And I could see there would be little clusters of bikes at different houses because kids were outside doing things, hanging out with each right. other. Now, every time I drive through my childhood neighborhood, even neighborhoods down here in Texas, I don't see that. I don't see the clusters of bikes. I don't see kids outside doing anything. Everybody is inside totally isolated. Amazing. So um, is there hope for your generation and millennials? I think that millennials are probably in a better sense in terms of overall well-being than we are. My generation and the people younger than me are going to be some of the most dysgenic people that the world has ever seen because we are so mentally and spiritually ill. And then also we're very ugly. We're very unhealthy. We're very overweight and because <laughs> of the hormones in the food and in the water supplies. Yeah. Are, we're not developing properly. Like obviously testosterone is down, I think 40% in the last 40 years, but people are very androgynous. And that of course leads to things like transgenderism or homosexuality because they have no sense of true feminine or masculine identity identity because everything is so blurred, not only through the society, but also biologically too. They're literally waging biological warfare on our younger generations. And you can see this reflected just in how the way they look. Nobody looks healthy in an average American high school or middle school anymore. That's amazing. So let me ask, growing up, you never smoked pot or drank or done, have done any of those things? No, I never got into drugs. I think I had, well, so when I was I think a toddler, my dad would always drink, uh, what is it, Miller Genuine Draft at dinner. <laughs> and I would go up and I'd grab it and I would swig it back and he would laugh and my mom would go, no, don't let him do that. So that was <laughs> about the extent of my, uh, my alcohol consumption. And then I think when I was in high school or maybe middle school, when we were at one of my buddy's house and uh, we were like, oh, dude, let's drink a beer. And so we snuck one of his dad's beers out of the fridge and we split it into three little cups. So each of us were drinking four ounces of like a light beer. And it was just so disgusting. I didn't even finish it. And then my buddy was trying to be cool. So I remember he was like, oh, you're not going to finish your beer, you know, <laughs> pussy. And he like, he took it and he drank it. And I thought that was funny. But, you know, those experiences I think are important for young men to have. And a lot of guys online who, because it's so hard for young guys to have, you know, authentic male friendships yeah, now, yeah. they would hear a story like that and they would say, oh, that's degenerate, that's degenerate. And it's like, it's not degenerate because degenerate literally means degeneration, being in a state that is new uh, compared to, you know, uh, previous generations that is less good. And every generation of men dating back to, I don't even know when, would have a story to the effect of, yeah, you know, we were had a beer together and we yeah. stole it from my dad or something. And I think that's important Absolutely. to kind of have that mischief. But now guys don't have friends and they're not causing mischief, doing things that are important for young men to do, you know, causing trouble. And then I'll tell a story about like, oh yeah, you know, when I was in high school, my friends and I got stopped by the police because we egged someone's house or something. And they'll say like, oh, don't you respect law and order? Oh, that's degenerate. <laughs> You're acting like black people. <laughs> it's just like, come on, man, go outside, have some fun. Yeah, absolutely. When you hear uh, everybody and their mama calling white guys, straight guys, Christian guys, um, white supremacy. What, what does that, how does, does that affect you? What do you think about that? I think it's ridiculous um, because in, this is not only true if you ask any white person, but if you look at the history of racial politics in this country, virtually all of it is just white people wanting to like be doing their own thing. And then black people wanting to be like, actually, we want more money. Actually, we want this, this, and this. So like white supremacy means that white people want to govern over everybody else. White people don't want to do that. We basically right. just want to be left alone. Yeah. And, and they'll say, well, colonization, it's like, okay, what was that, like 200 years ago? It's not important now. Or even like white nationalism, like no white guy 
wants to live in an only white country. I don't want to kick you out of my country. I wouldn't want to live in a country without the fallen state. So it's just a completely <laughs> inaccurate way to describe the way that, you know, typically right wing people are, are going about talking about things like immigration or race relations. I used to think that when they used that word white supremacy, it, it was a negative word. But now I realize what they're thinking is that and, and it's true, by the way, that <laughs> that white men are smarter than them, superior to them. And, and instead of learning, oh, hey, how did you become so superior? They want to destroy it so that they won't be reminded how dumb they are. And so they're dumbing everybody and everything down rather than coming up to the level of white supremacy. Yeah, I like the way that Gavin McInnes used to describe it. He used to say, uh, you know, white people, we're just good at systems. You know, here's yeah. your ticket. Go pay for your food over there. And it's true. We're just we're very good at, you know, constructing these little systems. The trains run on time. We have, we have a good thing going here. And I think that people, uh, it's a thankless job, I'll say, being a white guy in America in 2022. But if you notice, it's true that white people are good at systems because when you destroy that, it, the uh, services goes down, the quality of work and the quality of life goes down rather than goes up when white people stop being themselves, when you're not allowed to be in a class that says you're smarter than the dumb kids in the, in the class, you know, they, they lower the standard and things get worse rather than getting better. What do you think about the shooting that happened in uh, Texas the other day at the school? Um, I mean... I guess obviously it's a tragedy, but I can't say that I'm surprised. And I think that the discourse surrounding it, I would say the ratio of the discourse surrounding it in terms of how stupid it is to how significant this change is in American culture is like astounding to me because mass shootings, as we understand them now, only date back to like the mid 1980s. No one prior to that in American society would ever feel inclined to walk into a place and just open fire. This is a very new thing. And instead of analyzing it intelligently, people just want to score points on each other and wait eagerly by their televisions or by their phones to find out, oh, was this guy a Democrat? Was he white? Was he just to like, you know, score little points with each other? No one actually wants to have an intelligent conversation as to why these things are happening. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, they had that shooting in uh, that shooting happened in Buffalo where the young white guy went and shot up some blacks. Yeah. And all of a sudden, they want to take away the Second Amendment. They want to uh, call white people, white straight men, terrorists. So they want terrorist laws, all kinds of things. But I noticed that when it happened to white people by well, the blacks and others, there's no big deal about it at all. Why do you think that is? Simply because the narrative is anti-white. I mean, everything that exists in terms of like race relations in this country, when it's filtered through the lens of the media, will always paint white people as the villains and non-white people as the heroes, which is why even people of color, what does that imply? I mean, that was a term that was developed in some sort of think tank. Yeah. It implies that all non-white people, who, by the way, as I'm sure you know, there's a lot of infighting between dark-skinned black people, light-skinned black people, black men, black women, even you know Asians as a continent, they all hate each other. Yeah. So it's all not, oh, and Hispanics, ask them how they feel about black people. So you've got yeah. all of these- They hate black people. Yeah, they they really do, which, you know, it is what it is, I suppose. But you've got all these non-white people unified against white people, or even the phrase color, you know, they have color. They're more vivacious and beautiful than these bland vanilla white people. The term in itself implies the white people are like lesser than, but that's just the way it is. And, you know, if you look at the crime statistics, which is something that nobody talks about anymore, if you take the amount of black, because if you want to measure racism, I mean, race, racism is an abstraction that doesn't really, yeah. you can't quantify that. So if you think, okay, racism is prejudice, it's, you know, racism, what are some metrics that we know that you could probably use to ascertain how racist different groups of people are. I would say interracial homicide is probably a good measure of how much one group hates another group. And if you take the amount of black people who murder white people every year in this country and subtract from that number, the amount of white people who murder black people this year or every year in this country, you get a difference of about 600, about 600 more black people killing white people in this country every year than the inverse. But we don't talk about that, which by the way, they always talk about, you know, white people being racist. Look at lynching when white people were murdering black black people for no reason. At the height of lynching in this country, they were only lynching about 100 black people every year. 
So literally the amount of blacks killing whites in terms of it happening more than the inverse in this country is six times the amount of white people lynching black people uh, at the height of it. But nobody talks about that and it happens every year. But lynching is of course something that's written about in the history books. They just passed a law at the federal level, an anti-lynching law. And white people are taught this from infancy as an example of why we're so evil, even though like no white person is ever going to perpetuate violence typically in their lives. And the only place they're going to witness it is in public schools that are diverse, like, or at a sporting event where people get too drunk. But as a general rule, white people growing up in like, you know, Northern Maine who go to some school are never going to experience violence unless they integrate into communities that aren't white. Yeah, I totally agree. You wrote, I mean, you did an amazing video on Ukraine, Russia, and the American decline. Um, first, I wonder how long, how much research did you put into that? How long did it take you to bring that all together? Uh, quite a while. I think there was about a month gap between that and my last upload. I get very meticulous and perhaps even autistic with my, my process. I am, a, I really like making sure that everything I put out is exactly the way I want it. So I noticed that, that about and- white straight men and women, they try to be <laughs> perfect in everything they do. Yeah. So I think the video was about two hours long. It probably took me about 10 hours to record it just because I would, you know, watch something that I just said. And I thought that I should reorder the points or I should, you know, say this in a different way. So I get very meticulous with it. Um, And then even before I recorded it, I, I did, you know, weeks worth of just getting everything together, trying to organize the points in a specific way. And then editing it, of course, took another 10, 12 hours. So yeah, I get, I get very uh, meticulous with my process. It's very done, a nice work, though, man. I do have to say that. Well, thank you. What is the Russian uh, point of view and why is Putin doing what he's doing? More or less just because Ukraine as a – well, I guess the first thing to say would, that, would be that we're only now calling it Ukraine. I mean, I even remember, and I'm sure you do as well, and much of the audience remembers, that forever it was referred to as the Ukraine. The Ukraine, because Ukraine literally translates to borderland. It exists as a border region between the two competing powers, which of course are the European Union and NATO, and then Russia. So if you're a borderland in a neutral nation, your job is going to try to be at worst case, you know, amicable uh, with the two competing countries who are, you know, on sharing your borders, because you don't want there to be a situation where one country feels as though you're cozying up to the other country so much because you're going to put them in a tough position where they might have to, you know, invade you or something. And so what's happened basically is a, a systematic expansion of the NATO territories eastward, integrating formerly Baltic states, which of course were a part of the, the Soviet Union, to a point where now they're literally trying to integrate Ukraine and have the borders of Russia be touching NATO's borders, which would then create a situation where you have missiles that could reach Moscow on the borders with Russia. And so Russia obviously doesn't want this. And we've also been breaking our promises because we told them that we wouldn't expand an inch eastward. That was the quote. And we've broken that promise over the course of a few decades. And uh, yeah, Russia now feels as, as though it's in a situation where Ukraine poses a genuine threat to their national security, which isn't just because it exists as a border region that's now going to potentially be occupied by NATO, but also because Ukraine's government has demonstrated that they are willing to act as a proxy force for the globalist American empire, it's being called, because they had a pro-Russia or at least Russian sympathetic government in 2014 that was toppled by a coup that was sponsored by the United States State Department and NATO, which took out that government and installed a frankly illegitimate government that is basically a puppet force for NATO and for the United States. And so that's the government that has been very anti-Russia and has been flirting with the idea of joining NATO. They refused to re-sign the agreement saying that they were going to be friends with Russia. And so they're really putting Russia in a tough position. And so Russia is just doing this, I think, as a defensive measure, which of course people in the West can't understand because they view all conflicts as though they're through the lens of a superhero movie, where there's this bad guy who's just crazy for no reason and he just wants power. And then there's the heroes who are the good guys who don't do anything wrong and they want to beat the bad guys. Yeah. And this is like what the constant fixation on media has done to how people perceive geopolitics. It's like a child's understanding of the whole situation, but that's why they talk to us like we're children, right? The one thing that uh, that uh, concerned me or I wonder about, how come America is so against Russia? And then I thought maybe they think, see Russia as a communist country, maybe something like that. But why is it, if they're so against Russia, why they're so in love with China? And 
China seems to be worse than Russia or the same, or worse. Why do you think they support one and against the other if they're both communist countries? I don't think that either of them are really communist in the sense that we would understand from maybe the halfway point of the 20th century. Um, I think with China, it's much more businesses siding with them and being more open with that because they're basically staking their bets on that China is going to be the dominant superpower in 20 years and the United States is not. And China has made very clear that they're going to reward their friends and, and punish people who were acting as though they're their enemies. So businesses have an incentive to at least cozy up to China. But you'll notice that the State Department doesn't cozy up to China. The, the, the media won't cozy up to China. You know, they'll say things about like how we're treating the Uyghur Muslims and they'll accuse China of all these human rights violations, which maybe are true, maybe they're not. But I think Russia and China are both fundamentally threats to America and to the West because they exist as strong nationalist countries which have made very clear that they're willing to do whatever it takes to preserve their heritage and their history. And the West wants to basically be the, the advocate for global communism. And the biggest impediment to that agenda is, of course, going to be strong nationalist countries who don't want to submit to a globalist agenda. Now, China, it's been argued, has more or less submitted to it just because they're willing to trade with us. But I don't think that's indicative of the real liberalization that they want out of these countries. You know, China is still uh, very homophobic, very racist, very patriarchal. And these are all things that are crucial to their identity and how they perceive themselves. They're also like more or less ethno-nationalists. Han Chinese believe that they are like the master race of people. And so they're willing to trade with the rest of the world, but they're not willing to submit to its agenda, which is more or less defined by, you know, the LGBT flag. <laughs> what a mess. Do you think that and Putin will go nuclear if they keep messing with him? No, I don't think that's going to happen. But I mean, if they crossed a certain line, maybe it could get to that point. But I think that he's a genius. I think that he's a very calculated political actor. And I think that he's four steps ahead of, you know, our smartest person at the, at the State Department is likely a diversity hire. So I think that everything that we're doing to respond uh, to his actions, he's anticipated and has an advantageous counter for. So I don't think it's going to get to that point. I would certainly hope not. But on the same note, it wouldn't exactly be the worst thing in the world if parts of this country were subjected to nuclear hellfire. I mean, we're an abominable country. We glorify everything that is the most wrong and abominable. So maybe we deserve it. And I think the only reason we haven't gotten to that point is probably because there are still parts of the righteous remnant left. And as long as those people stay righteous, I guess we'll be we'll be spared. But you know, it really it really wouldn't be the worst thing in the world if places maybe like New York City or Washington D.C. <laughs> were just deleted. I mean, these are terrible, yeah. godforsaken places. So I want to ask this. And I got I have so many things I want to ask you about. But you mentioned mass formation psychosis. Yes. Um, and in regard to this war, what is that about? It's basically about all of the media apparatuses coming together to convince the population of a certain position. So, you know, this is the, the NPC meme. Previous generations would call this groupthink, but now it's being called mass formation psychosis. And you'll notice how overnight a consensus was formed that being pro-Ukraine is the correct position. There was virtually no media outlet that was willing to offer a counter position. At best, you would see, a, well, let's wait for more. Let's maybe be neutral. But you would not see a pro-Russia position or an anti-Ukraine or anti-NATO position. It just didn't exist. And there were sort of, I guess, breadcrumbs leading to this with things like Black Lives Matter or even the COVID narrative. But with both of those, with Black Lives Matter, for example, that didn't become a household name until 2020, sure, but that started in 2014 with Trayvon Martin. You had in 2016 with um, you know Michael Brown. So th there were stepping stones leading up to it becoming like a huge thing, but now it's like gone. With the COVID narrative too, that was initially the left wing being skeptical of it because they thought that Donald Trump was trying to use that to manufacture a crisis to stay in power. And then once it became clear that it was going to be a segue for mail-in voting, which could uh, fortify the election in a way that was advantageous to them. Then they all became very outspokenly in support of it. But in terms of the subscription rates from the, the whole country and also the expediency in which they were able to achieve that, the Ukraine thing really is the greatest example. I mean, you had people on the left, people on the right, all coming together saying that we have to support Ukraine, that Russia's the enemy. They were activating this boomer tier Cold War nostalgia. You had members of Congress, you know, posing with the, this flag, this disgusting hybrid flag they'd created. <laughs> it was a mixture of the American flag and the Ukrainian flag. And the average American held the position that 
that Ukraine was good, but also has no idea where it is on a map, of course, but also has no idea what our interests are in that country. They just think back to, oh, I saw Red Dawn. I played a video game one time where the Russians were the bad guys. So I guess they really are the biggest threat to my freedom instead of my own government, which actually is the case. You know, I'm glad you dropped out of college. You wouldn't be this smart had you stayed. It's true. It is true. Uh, I'm really glad, man. So how do you feel like, where do you get the energy from that you do this research and know all this stuff? You have more details about what's really happening than the average media person, especially the liberal media and some conservative. Where do you get the, the want to, the, the, the energy to put all this together? <laughs> I would like to say that it's love of country, but if I really had to be honest, I would say it's probably spite. Uh, because <laughs> when I was in high school, there were a lot of these, you know, liberal elite types who always gave me a hard time because I basically just wanted to like cause mischief with my friends. And I would still be in the same advanced classes as these kids. I would still actually score higher on standardized tests, which of course are a proxy for an IQ test. I would score higher on like every metric by which you would want to measure excellence. I was still outperforming these people, but they would always roll their eyes at me because I would talk during class or I'd be on my phone looking at memes or whatever. And I always kind of felt this sense of like wanting to prove these people wrong because then when I became outspokenly conservative, they gave me a really hard time. You know, I was in the principal's office at least once a week, which, you know, it's not the end of the <laughs> world, but it was because they would submit yeah. anonymous tips to the school district and accuse me of being in, involved in hate groups, uh, accuse me of being involved in all sorts of weird things because I would like voice an opinion in my, my high school AP US history class. So they gave me a really hard time. And so I more or less decided that my like, overriding ambition for the rest of my life is going to be to make these types of people's lives as difficult as possible because these are the types of kids that grow up to be the ones occupying the bureaucracy, yeah. to be the ones trying to become senators. They have no regard for the people who they perceive to be lower than them. They don't actually care. They just want to masturbate to their own self-perception of, oh, I'm a senator. I'm a really sophisticated intellectual. I, I read from the New York Times bestseller list. And it's like, no, you're not that smart. You're not that cool. And I'm going to I'm not going to do anything to you, but I, I will try to make your life a little bit harder, I suppose. Yeah, all, they're on an ego trip. Will you, will you run for president one day, you think? I don't know if we'll have a country by that point, but I think that uh, I think I'll be around for a while in terms of the the conversation. I don't know exactly what chair I'll end up in, uh, end up in, but I think I'll be around for a while. Right on. You you have said that 95 percent of people are NPCs. True. What is NPC? What is that? NPCs. So an NPC uh, comes from a video game, and they're non-playable characters. So the idea is that NPCs just exist as accessories to you know the character storyline. So to call someone an NPC is to basically say that they don't have agency. They're not capable of thinking about things critically, forming their own thoughts. They're basically just waiting what to be told by the power structures in society. And so I think, yeah, that's a fair estimate that 95% of people are like this. You know, yeah. they'll get up, they'll get dressed, they'll, you know, eat some food, they'll go to work and they'll turn on NPR and they will basically be confident that whatever they're hearing from the media is what is true. But these people also, if you talk to them and poll them and ask ask them, do you think the media lies? They'll say, of course, of course the media lies, but they won't actually connect the dots as to the cognitive dissonance that they're experiencing while still believing all the things that the media tells them. You are, um, you know, reflecting on when I first talked to you back in 2019 and now you definitely grown. Your strength is so apparent now. And um, how does, how would an NPC overcome because you seem to be your own man doing your own thing and you have courage. How does an NPC become like that? How do you overcome being an NPC? I don't think it's possible, actually. I think that um, people who perhaps agree with NPCs can eventually recognize that they're not doing their own research. And these are the people who will feel compelled to seek out truth. But I think that people who at their core have no desire to seek out truth, I think that's basically intrinsic to who they are yeah. as people. And there's nothing 
inherently wrong with that. I mean, that's human nature. The problem is that the people who are in charge of telling them what is true are trying to purposefully drive them away from God and away from the truth. Yeah. And that's the real problem. You know, I actually don't think that people should have to know about politics. I really don't. I think that it's actually a symptom of a bad society that people feel as though they have to be glued into the 24 hour news cycle all day. I think that we should have a government and we did for a very long time that was going to act in the best interest of its people. And it was actually true that you could just get up, go to work, put food on the table for your family, and you wouldn't have to follow the 24-hour news cycle. You read the paper, oh, they built a park. Oh, they spent too much money on the roads. Damn it, I don't like the way they're wasting my tax dollars. (laughs) But you wouldn't have to know all the facts and figures the way that I do now. And I think it's actually unhealthy that so many young people, by necessity though, are getting involved in politics because they recognize that if somebody doesn't do something, we're not going to have a country for them to live in. You know, I was thinking of now that you've explained what NPC mean, um, and and you're right, it's hard for an NPC or people who are like that to overcome that. Non-NPCs are like that when they are kids. They're not NPC even as a kid. And I've spoken to people around the world over these last 32 years, and when they're a little kid, there was something about them that was different than the rest of the kids, uh, or mm. what probably NPC kids then. But you either are born that way or you're not. It's already with you or it's not. What would you yeah. say about that? I completely agree with that. I think it really, and it's sad because we really want to believe, you know, the most common question I get, I'm sure you get this all the time, is how do I change people's minds about something? <laughs> yeah. And it's like, you're not talking about somebody who is just a political. I mean, you're talking about people who are wearing like triple masks inside of their cars. Like that person <laughs> is never going to be able to be red pilled. So right. To speak. So yeah, unfortunately, it really just is a matter of people who have the capacity to get it or people who just don't. And I found uh, that once they do get it, they get it pretty quickly. Like yeah. I think that I started to really get things when I was like in high school. And I can remember agreeing with arguments that I see adults making now when I was like 12 years old, particularly about God, you know, I would read these very basic atheist arguments and I would say, hmm, that makes sense because that was before I came back to Christianity. And I can now see people reciting those same arguments. And I was like, wow, I believed that when I was like 10 years old. That's so funny that you never got past that point. You never sought out the truth. You were very comfortable with like staying at that point. In your video, you talk about guarding your own, one of your videos, you talk about guarding your own heart. What Mm. do you mean by that? Well, that was something my mom always used to tell us. I think it comes from Proverbs, actually, which is that you have to guard your heart. And she would tell this to my sister, you know, she'd be dating boys and she, well, you have to be careful with, you know, who you fall for because, you know, you can get hurt. But I think that also pertains to how we view politics and media. Yeah. Because, you know, when they were pitching the Ukraine war, you didn't have uh, an official coming on and saying, okay, here are the arguments for it. Here are the arguments against it. You had pandering. You had emotional propaganda. You had pictures and videos of bombed out buildings, of mothers carrying children. All of these things were designed to emotionally manipulate people. And that's why we get so frustrated as non-NPCs, as protagonists, arguing with these people. Like they can't argue from logic. And it's like, of course not. They can only argue from emotion because they were only convinced by emotion. And so- Yeah, with all this propaganda, that's like what it serves, the emotional purpose. And emotions are what compels people to act. And that's the problem. I'm not going to read something and say, oh, it turns out that this is true. I'm going to bring now my passion to fight for this. That's why you could never sit down with one of these like pro-mask people, for example, over coffee, six feet apart, I guess, and convince them of your position. It would never happen. They would maybe say, if you completely embarrassed them and they had no argument left, they would say, well, I just need to do more research. And they would leave. They would (laughs) never say, you know what, you're right. And bring that same passion, that same energy to your side. Same thing with abortion advocates. They would never bring that same indignation to the pro-life side. It would just never happen. So emotions above all else are what compels people to act. And so when I say guard your heart, That means you have to be very careful about what you allow to manipulate your emotions, to manipulate your heart, because they want you to be glued to the screen. Oh, this tragedy happened. We have to do this. Look at this thing that happened. It's so terrible. And as men, I think we're less susceptible to this than women. 
but that doesn't mean we don't recognize tragedy when it happens. Right. But we're blessed with the, the resolve to be able to say, well, just because this is bad doesn't mean we have to throw all of our eggs into this basket, which obviously isn't going to work. We're much more able to divorce, uh, you know, emotional reactionary ideas from what is actually true and real and what works. But as men have become more feminine, feminine over the last few decades, this has coincided with that 24-hour news cycle, with the complete syndication of politics and media everywhere you go. So now you see all of these men, not coincidentally, in support of these emotionally driven narratives. Yep. And these are things that their grandfathers would have belted them for. Like, <laughs> you really believe that, you idiot? That what, is you so true. Theory? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you did. Uh, in uh, guarding your heart against media and propaganda, I saw that with when I see that with the right with the Ukraine situation, they always show these women crying and kids on the road and what about the kids and blown up buildings and uh, so many people falling for it because they do become emotional and also with the um, with this whole um, shooting that happened in. Uh, uh, New York, upstate New York, somewhere, with the white guy shooting the black people, accused of shooting the black people. They make it all emotional. But if it was the other way around, it would be not emotional because they want the white person to look like a white supremacy, they call it. And, but, and, and so they'll make it where they get you angry rather than all sad and then so you can strike out at white people. Um, that is amazing to see that. I'm blown away how smart you are, man. Well, thank you for saying that. Wow. That's a tremendous endorsement. That well, is it's a, interesting, too. It's like, I've never heard of a young person like you before. If they had actually uh, been allowed to express emotion for like what we saw in Wisconsin, for example, it's positive. Like yeah. there were an alarming amount of replies to those news stories on Twitter, which isn't the real world, but it's not not the real world of people saying, well, that's what you get for slavery. Well, that's what you get for Jim Crow. And it's like, the kid that died, that little child, had no concept of those things. Are you kidding me? <laughs> that's and, right. Like, he deserved that because of the sins of his ancestors or something? Like, that's the most ridiculous proposition. But that's something that's entertained, actually, now in modern discourse. Well, even if people who bring up Jim Crow and all that, they don't know about Jim Crow. They, they, mm -hmm. I, I grew up on a, when Jim Crow existed down in Alabama. Mm -hmm. And the things that the people say about Jim Crow today is not true. Because at the time, we knew that Jim Crow was about keeping the blacks out of the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like this big old thing where black people were held down, they couldn't function. Jim Crow was this, it just wasn't like that at all. So they lie about that. I got to ask you, because of time here, you write about, uh, you have a video called The Simp About Video. What's The Simp and what about them? A simp uh, is a guy who is basically elevating women on this incredibly artificial pedestal. And he is giving them attention. He's giving them resources, which is what women want. He's giving them attention. He's giving them money, time, yeah. and he's receiving nothing in return. And in most cases, these women are, we call them now mids. They're very unexceptional. They're not attractive. You know, you could almost justify that if this woman were like the most beautiful woman <laughs> in the state. But these women are all like painfully average. But because guys are so antisocial now and their fathers have failed them, they didn't teach them how to talk to women the first girl that shows these guys any attention, they fall for. And they're willing to move out of state to go live next to these girls just I at know. a chance of going on a date. Yeah. It is the most pathetic thing. They're betas, aren't they? They're the most beta. pathetic thing <laughs> that, that's imaginable. But yeah. this is like the state of young men in this country. They're uh, they're simps. They're they're uh, <laughs> yeah, they're not willing to have any self-respect and like myself, you know, save myself for my uh my woman who has not produced some form of pornography of herself, she's not going to be <laughs> of average attractive uh, quality. She's going to be well above average. So it's unfortunate. Do single mother increase the number of simps? Sorry? Do, do single mother have anything to do with the increase of simps? 100%. 100%. It's, it's literally, it's causal. And it's not just because of the lack of the father being there to guide them and teach them how to be a man. It's exactly as you said, it's the single mother in itself. Yeah. Because if you grow up with a single mother, your entire conception of the world is based on how do I get my mom to like me? You need the approval of your mother because if your mother's mad at you, she's not going to feed you. She's not going to do whatever. She's not going to act as your mother. She's not going to nurture you, which you need as a young boy. You need to be nurtured right. by your mother. And so they grow up with the single mom, 
And the mom, of course, because she's crazy, which is probably why she's a single mom, has no idea of what it takes to like court a woman. So she'll tell the son, oh, you have to just be nice to girls. You have to get them flowers. Yeah, we'll let them walk all over you. Women don't like that. Women don't like nice guys. They actually resent them. You know, the best thing that a woman could ever say to a man is something to the effect of, you're such a jerk, but I don't know why I still like you. Something like that. That is, if you hear that, you're doing the right thing. (laughs) So. You definitely have the old school mentality, man. Well, you have to. You know, the country was better back then, so you have to sort of mimic that if possible. It's mind blowing to see it, though, and you're so clear about it. Two quick other things: can a person overcome, or can you stop them from being a simp? Yes. And how? Uh, stop talking to women, not indefinitely, but. Until you stop being a simp, stop giving them resources unless you're getting reciprocity. That's, by the way, what defines the simp, the reciprocity or the lack thereof. If you're dating a girl and you really like her, be nice to her. Sure, get her presence. But if she's leaving you on open, she's not answering your text messages, have some self-respect, stop simping after her. Go to the gym, start lifting weights, start eating more red meat, more eggs, take care of yourself, figure out what your mission is and dedicate everything to that. Your priority is not your wife or your woman. It is your mission. She wants that. She wants a guy who has a mission. She doesn't want some guy whose mission is to be super nice to her and tell her that she looks really hot in her size eight bikini. That's not what she wants. She wants a <laughs> guy who is driven and focused on something greater than himself that she can attach herself to. So figure out what that is for your life. It could be being the manager of an ACE hardware, or it could be being the president. As long as you have something, that's all you need. And you will find yourself a relatively decent woman. So I went and had a physical exam last year and the doctor tested my testosterone level. Mm -hmm. and And he told me, it was through the roof, and he was surprised, right? I'm like, of course right it is. <laughs> you say that the testosterone levels in modern men have gone way down. Yes. First of all, tell the folks what testosterone is and why has it gone down in modern men? Testosterone is the male hormone, and I cannot stress this enough. You are your hormones. They, com- they are, are everything about you, your, your musculature, your bone development, your brain development, all of that is influenced by your male hormone or if you're a woman, your female hormone. So what's happened in the last few generations is we've had testosterone go down. And they talk about this the same way they talk about everything bad that happens uh, that's going to hurt you know white American men. Oh, this is just happening. Well, we don't know why. It's just happening. No, we know exactly why it's happening. And it's because our lifestyles have become more sedentary. People are sitting around all day. They're unhealthy. The foods they're eating contain microplastics. They contain phthalates, estrogens, things like that. Our water supply has runoff estrogen in it from birth control. So you've got men, soy too, for example, they're eating all of these things that are directly lowering their testosterone. And we just think this is just happenstance. Now, also, we've been fed a lie that as you get older, your testosterone naturally decreases. That's actually not true. You're a great example of this. If you live a healthy lifestyle, your testosterone, sure, maybe it's going to dissipate a little bit, but it's not just going to start dropping as you get older. What that is, is the manifestation of a lifestyle pattern of eating unhealthy, sitting around all day. Over time, yeah, your testosterone is going to be lower as you age because of that. But if you're staying active and staying healthy, that's not going to go down. And if your testosterone is lower, you become more agreeable. You become more susceptible to the herd consensus. There are literally studies that have proven as you increase people's testosterone, they become more conservative because being conservative <laughs> just means being normal, yeah. quite literally. Yeah. I was surprised when the doctor told me that because when I moved here to LA, I heard that your testosterone goes down, mm-hmm. especially when you get older. So I and my doctor was surprised it was gone through the roof. Uh, what made you interested in that? That you I were think in- that- That's the root of everything. Uh, I mean, you are your hormones. And we have people who are dysgenic, they're androgynous, they feel unconfident. I mean, if you have adequate and normal testosterone levels, you will literally be happier, you will be more confident, you will feel more like a man, you will be able to say no to things, you will be less averse to conflict. I know, but you're such a young man, when you like walking down the road one day and decide, you know what, let me see what my testosterone level is. What may what may literally that's because my friends and I were (laughs) We're giving each other a hard time calling each other, you know, beta males. We're calling each other, oh, you have low T because so I have a lot of body hair. 
And my friends were making fun of me for it. And I was like, why are you mad? Because my testosterone is higher than yours. And they were like, no, it's not. I was like, yeah, it literally, that's what that means. That's why. <laughs> yeah. So we went, we got our team measure, got our blood drawn and I did have higher testosterone. So I felt very good about myself, but <laughs> it's true. Like if we had men with normal testosterone levels, like we did all throughout history, they look different. They look more like men. They act more like men because what defines male behavior is testosterone above all other things. Amazing, man. So give me a yes or no on this because the time is totally out. Up, up. Do you, and we, I have you back. I definitely want to have you back to talk more about some of these other things. Do you believe that racism exists? Yes. And why? Uh, because I'm white and I've experienced it for my <laughs> whole life. <laughs> and so uh, have you dated before? Have you ever dated? Yeah. And how do the girls deal with you? Because you're so solid. You don't seem like they can control you in the way they do with other millennials and Zs. How do they handle you? How do they deal with you? They, I mean, you know, no one's going to believe this because everyone likes to talk about me online. Like, I'm, you know, this loser, nerd, incel. The girls I date, like, fall in love with me every time because they're not used to having a guy who is, like, very steadfast in principles. Yeah. And, you know, I read a post online, for example, that was this woman complaining that her husband said that women shouldn't have the right to vote. And she was like, I'm not going to, you know, sleep in the same room with him anymore. And I was just like, how could you not tell her that earlier? Like, you know, when I talk to girls, I tell them straight up, like the most controversial opinions I have, usually to torment them, because I think the reactions are funny, <laughs> but they always, you know, they like it. They they would literally yeah. rather have a guy be convicted in his principle yeah. of being like, you know, the worst guy ever than some guy who's just like, I think that everyone should be equal and equality is good. And I love women. It's like, <laughs> no, I don't. I, that's not me. I'm anti-liberal. I'm illiberal. I'm not for equality. And I'm very open with that. And yeah, they, they like it. So amazing. So listen, I got to We got to heat this uh, interview up. I'm a, I got to throw you on the hot seat. Okay. And I need you to answer these questions as quickly as possible. Okay. The hot seat. Do you love white people? Yes. Is it wrong to be a white nationalist? Yes, depending on the definition. Should China pay reparation for, Chi for the Chinese virus? No. Have you ever been a vegan? No. What is a woman? Uh... <laughs> A human who has the reproductive infrastructure to bear children. Is hell a real place? Yes. What is love? I think something that God gives us to uh, create families. Who has more privilege, black people or gay people? Black people. Was it a mistake to educate women? Largely, depending on the definition of education, yes. <laughs> Should social media be censored in any circumstance? Uh, communists should be deplatformed, yeah. Is it wrong to have sex before marriage? Yes. Uh, do you have anger? No. What is a man? A human who has the capacity to uh, deposit life material into a woman. <laughs> Amazing. Did you have fun? I had a great time. I had a blast. Thank you, man, for being on. I really, really, really am happy to see your growth. So I'm glad we did this interview. Uh, yeah. Tell the folks how to get to Heck Off Comedy, uh, Comedy or whatever else you're doing. Yeah, uh, so you can go to youtube.com slash John Doyle. That's where I'm at usually. Uh, you can go to heckoffcommy.com and find me there too. So, yeah. John, it's good to see you again, man, and I look forward to talking to you because there are other videos I want to talk to you about that I saw of your racism, Martin Luther King, the whole, that whole mess. And so next time, <laughs> next time we'll go right into a lot of those things. Oh, one last thing, will you vote for the, you voted for the Great White Hope? Oh, yeah. yeah. Will you vote for him again? Oh, I'd make him king in a heartbeat. <laughs> All right. Thank you for coming on, man. It's good to see you, and I definitely wish you well. And I, as a matter of fact, I'm looking to see what just tomorrow brings for you. Keep it up, all right? Thank you for saying that. Yeah, I would love to anytime. All right. God bless you. Thank you all for tuning in uh, to this Father's State. This episode was amazing. Don't forget to like, follow, ring the bell. 
go to our uh, subscribe star there. Um, hit the description links to support our work. Father State is there. Check out the merch and let us hear from you. Thank you so much for tuning in. I absolutely appreciate it.